Welcome, welcome everyone. We're gonna give everybody just a few minutes to trickle in from the waiting room. All right, as we get the last few people who are waiting in the waiting room and everyone else who's coming in right at three o'clock, I'll start laying out um, our event today. So welcome everyone to our third virtual author visit with the Lincoln Public Library. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Katherine Hunt and I have the great good luck to be the director of the Lincoln Public Library. And today I have the fantastic and amazing Reese Bowen with me. So thank you so much for joining us. Hi. Hi. How are you? <laughs> Being willing to adapt to the new Zoom format, which is always oh, interesting. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, the nice thing about the Zoom format is you see my nice blouse, you have no idea what I'm wearing underneath. <laughs> <laughs> and on a, some of these, we have gotten pets to come in and join too. So if you've got any little furry creatures who come in, Wish I had. I only have a furry husband, but he, he won't uh, come well, in. <laughs> You know, if he wanders in, have him wave. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> so the general format of what we're going to do today is Reese and I are going to have a conversation. We have some questions talking about her work and her practice. Um, after that, we'll open it up to questions and answers. Uh, actually, through the entire conversation, you can start dropping your questions into the question and answer box in Zoom. That's toward the bottom of your screen. Um, as those come in, when we get to the question and answer, I will read through them and we'll have a conversation about those. If you're not able to type in, we will have a chance at the end where we can activate your phone or your mic and you can ask um, verbally, but we do find that we can get through the Q&A a little bit faster and get some more questions. So we prioritize those ones first. Um, and then I don't know if we have any book covers or anything that are jumping in, but if you do see the screen change, that's on purpose. Unless I tell you otherwise, we're gonna go with it's all on purpose. The only other thing I have before we really get started is I have a quick poll for everyone. That's just a little bit of housekeeping to find out how you guys heard about the program. And if you've got guests with you, so you've got two or three people all watching on the same login, this lets us get a better um, attendance count, which we report out to the state library and they use to advocate so that we get the funding and resources we need to do cool programs like this. So, you guys should be seeing a quick poll. It's got two questions. On the first one, you can select as many options as you want, however you heard about this great program. And then the second question is how many are joining us on your login? So I'll give you guys all a moment to do that. Okay, last couple seconds to get those in. If you're still clicking through, we've got almost everybody participating, which is fantastic. We really appreciate it. Okay. Well, thank you so much, guys, for filling that in. I really appreciate that. And now we'll get started with the fun stuff and why you're here, which is hearing all about your work, Reese. So thank you again for joining us. Well, it's very nice of you to invite me. The sad thing is that I was supposed to be at your library in person at this moment. Um, <laughs> and then I was supposed to be at a conference which got canceled. So this is the next best thing. At least we get to say hi to each other at distance. Absolutely, absolutely. It is nice that we're at an age where we have the technology that we can adapt instead of having to just yeah. cancel a program. Yeah. So now, how did you get started writing? Did you fall in love with it right away or is it something that kind of crept up on you? Um, I've been a writer 
all my life. My mother tells me I wrote my first poem when I was four, so I have to believe her. Um, I've always I've always lived in the world of pretend and story. You know, most people grow out of this. They run around being princesses and birds and things. I've never grown out of it. That's my problem. I've never grown up. Um, so when I was little, I used to have these wonderful pretending word, worlds. And then I used to create stories for myself and my brother. And when I was a teenager, I really wanted to be a movie star. So I wrote scripts for myself just in case I became a movie star. So my scripts were all terribly dramatic and terribly sad. I always ended up with someone dying and everybody crying at the end. But they were, you know, they were they were great. I loved. Them. I was the star, so that's what mattered. Um, and then uh, I went. I after college, I went into the BBC in London, and I specialised eventually in the drama department. So I was working on plays and I find myself working on a play thinking, well, if I'd written this, I wouldn't have ended it like that. So I sat down and wrote a play and with the bravado of a 22 year old, I walked down the hall to the head of drama and I said, I've written this play. And a few days later, he called me in and he said, we really like this, we're going to do it. And I've been a professional writer ever since, which I think not many people can say. That is fantastic. Sometimes you just have to take that leap and, you know, believe in yourself. That is, that's an amazing story with walking down and just handing it over. When I was young, I did things that I would never dream of doing later because I didn't realize how potentious they were. I sold my first story to Scholastic Magazine because I happened to be in New York. And I went in to see Scholastic Magazine and saw the editor and said, I've written this story and she bought it. So, I mean... Who would dream of doing that now? You know, it's all these things that you wouldn't do if you're older and wiser, but you do do when you're young because you have no peers. So, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's just yeah. what's what what's the worst that can happen? You hear no. Yeah. Oh, that's brilliant. So now you mentioned that you started with writing plays and then scholastic. So I'm guessing that that was for youth or kids. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, How did you transition from kind of screenwriting and playwriting into novels and kind of longer fiction forms? Well, um, it was it was really forced on. I was doing very well with the BBC. Um, uh, You know, I'd written some other things. I was doing nicely. I got lured down to Australia by Australian television. I went down there and I hadn't been there long when I met my husband and he was on his way to California. Um, so we arrived in California and I realized if I wanted to write for TV, I'd have to live in LA and I'd have to write things like Dragnet, which were totally not me. You know, the sort of plays that the BBC put on were just so different. They were not always commercial. We had loads, a big budget in those days. We'd spend weeks on a rehearsal for something that was really a small sort of character driven piece. Um, and they didn't exist in America. So I wrote a children's book. And uh, I've had my share, more than my share of luck in my life. It was accepted pretty much instantly. They got a very famous illustrator for it. It came out and it became New York Times, one of the best books of the year. So um, again, because I was so naive and everything, I had no idea. I had a friendly librarian calling me saying, you have a starred review in Kirkus. And I'd say, oh, that's nice. And she said, but you have no idea. So it was a good start. So I found myself writing children's books. I moved on to young adult books um, and I was doing those and doing quite well with them. Uh, But that's the next stage of the story. If you have a question you wanted to ask me on that. Well, yeah. So you moved into young adult and then now though, you're well known for your mystery series that you've written. So what, what lured you into the beautiful world of murder mysteries? Uh, I've always been a big mystery fan. You know, I grew up with uh, all of those ladies of the golden age, Agatha Christie, Nio Marsh, Mar- Marjorie Alling and jo- Josephine Tay. And um, I used to love their books, but they were they were clever puzzles. Um, you know, they were the sort of books you'd just curl up with and read on a rainy afternoon. They never really touched your heart. I don't think anybody's ever wept for the body in the library. Um, so uh, they never really affected me in that way. But um, uh, it got to a stage when my teen, writing for teens was getting really boring for me. 
um, I'd done quite well. And it was a time when the YA books had literally taken off and as fast as I could write, the publisher would buy another one. And I'd said everything I wanted to say, you know, about going to the prom and not going to the prom and moving away and coming back again. And um, so uh, I, one day I was at the library. See, these all have something to do with libraries, which is great. <laughs> I was at the library and I discovered Tony Hilleman. And that was what completely blew me away. Here is someone writing mysteries. And yet what he's doing is taking you to another place. He's showing you an insight to another soul, another mentality. And it was all so vivid that when the first time I went to the Southwest, I was completely the tour guide. I was saying to my husband, you see that over there, that ship rock, and you see that ledge, that's where the body fell down. I knew everything because I'd read Tony Hellerman. And I thought, that's what I want to do. I want to write books that take somebody somewhere, that give them a mini vacation to a place. So I was thinking about um, where I might set these books. And I was telling a friend about my childhood experiences in Wales. My mother's family is Welsh. And every summer, my aunt Gladys would take me to stay with older relatives in Wales. And it's an area where, of course, Welsh is their first language. Mount Snowdon, all the mountains, beautiful, beautiful area with little villages nestled between the mountains and lots of quirks that were truly Welsh. For example, you only have very, very few last names in Wales. So you could have one village with eight people called Evans. And so they would differentiate these people by giving them a nickname. In my book, Evans, there's Evans the meat, who is the butcher. There's Evans the milk, who is the dairy man. There is Evans the post, who's the mailman. And they have all these fun nicknames. There was one village when I was in Wales that reputedly had a travel agent called Evans there and back. And they had an undertaker called Evans One Way. So, um, so I was telling, and, and also, you know, I've been taken up by Mount Snowden by every single hiking trail because my aunt was a very keen hiker. Uh, I knew how the people sounded. I knew I spoke quite a bit of Welsh. Um, so I was telling a friend about this and she said, oh, this is all good stuff. You ever put this in a book? And I thought, I do know this place. I know how the people talk. I know how they eat. I know what it's like when it rains and the ribbons of water run down the mountain sides and you see little white dots and their sheep and all those things. So I started writing a book with a Welsh police constable called Constable Evan Evans. And he's been a detective down in Swansea in a big city. And his father has been killed, also a detective, gunned down in a botched drug raid. And um, so Evan is having a real crisis about what matters in life. Does, you know, does it make any sense to be in the police force? So he goes back to a tranquil village in North Wales. And of course he hasn't been there long when a body is discovered as, um, oh yes, there we are, Evan's above. Well done, first book in the series. He hasn't been there long when like Miss Marple knew, I mean, she knew evil lurked in the most bu bucolic of settings. So that was the first book in, that got me into mysteries, Evan's above. And so I did 10 books in that series. Um, I really enjoyed them. I was going along nicely and Evan began to annoy me. Uh, he was the sort of man you really would like your daughter to bring home and say, this is who I'm gonna marry. You think, oh, good choice. Um, but he was rather polite. In fact, he was rather polite to when his superiors were horrible to him, instead of saying something, he'd sort of walk away with his head down. Um, I wanted someone who was a little more feisty, who would tell people what she thought of them, who wasn't always afraid, who wasn't always wise, um, a little bit more like me. I have been known to stand in the quick check line at Safeway and go one, two, three, four, five, six. Um, so um, I wanted to write about a first person feisty female. And I thought to myself, where could I set this feisty female? And, you know, I live in Marin County, California, which doesn't need any more sleuths. And I grew up in sort of genteel suburbia in England, doesn't need any more sleuths. Um, and then I went to Ellis Island and it was one of those places, it was only a free afternoon in New York and I thought I might as well take the tour of Ellis Island. I was completely unprepared by the emotional overload I felt. You know, I have no ancestors who came through Ellis Island myself. And um, standing there in the hallway, I, I, I just felt these walls were crying out saying, we have seen great joy and great sorrow. And then of course you get to the 
in Ellis Island, you look across and you see that Manhattan skyline and you know you're that close to America, but you cannot, get, you cannot take that tiny little step unless the government says you can. And I thought, oh, this is the ultimate locked room mystery. And so Molly Murphy became an Irish woman who flees from her native village when she accidentally kills the man who's trying to rape her. And he's the landowner's son and she knows she'll get no justice. So she flees as fast as she can. And she gets to um, Ellis Island using another woman's name. I'm not gonna tell you how that, you have to read the book for yourself. But um, she gets to Ellis Island using another woman's name. While she's on Ellis Island, a murder occurs and the name she's using shows up as one of the prime suspects. So that was the driving force behind Murphy's Law, the first book in that series, which, um, which came out and, please do, um, which came out and instantly um, got nominated for four awards and won three of them. Hello. Could you take that in the other room? I don't know why you had to take it in here. Um, oh, but um, yeah, so, so the series started off really well. And at the end of that book, obviously Molly Murphy steps ashore in New York, in Manhattan. And I thought to myself, what exactly do I know about New York in 1901? And I thought, nothing. I am doomed to research on every page for the rest of my life. And that is how it's proved to be. But you know, the research is the really fun part. You find so many interesting things. There is so much you can look at, you know, there's, uh, there is um, a New York Times for every day that I write about. I can find out who's doing what, who went to whose party, what they were wearing. I can find out that for every day I write about. So Molly has been going on now for 17 books. She's established herself in, in Manhattan after some, many ups and downs, lots of downs, in fact. Um, and she's become a detective of sorts. Um, and um, by the time we're at book 17, she's married and you'd have thought she might have settled down safely, but I don't think she has. Um, so they are a joy to write about because you do find out so many real things. I think if you're gonna write historicals, it's very important that you have real history involved because if she's living in New York, and for example, there is going to be a mayor's election she would know about that. Every time she went out, she would see great big posters. She would see people being dragged into voting booths. She'd be very aware. And one of the books um, was going to take place in September 1905. And I looked, I have a, a timeline for New York. I looked to see what had happened that month. And I saw that there'd been a train crash. The, the elevated railway had come off its tracks and plunged down to the street below and 42 people had been killed. And I thought, oh, Molly would have had to know about that train crash. And then I thought, what if she was on the train? So it changed the whole direction of the book, you know? So sometimes real history comes in and it gives you wonderful insights to things. So I found that really exciting that you can start with a good story, but then reality says, why don't we do this? And then you do that. So yes, so I've been doing Molly for 17 books now. That is fantastic. That's, that's interesting. And it leads into another question or topic that I wanted to talk to you about, which is, you know, you do do historical novels, which yes, is research. And so I was wondering if you could share a little bit, you know, you mentioned that you have a timeline, that there's a New York Times page for every day, but like, how do you work your research into the act of writing? Do you do a big research binge at the beginning? Or is this one of those ones where you got halfway through the book before you're you came across the month of September and that train crash and all of a sudden we're reworking. Well, what I do is when I know, I know sort of, before I start a book, I know what environment I want to set it in. For example, one of the Molly books, she goes undercover in the garment industry and we have the abuses in the ladies' sweatshops. Um, and so what I do is before the book starts, I read up all my background stuff. For example, the garment industry one, I read the Senate depositions after the Triangle Fire. So I knew what happened to the real girls. So everything that happened in my book had happened to a real girl. So I read that ahead of time. And I read like the formation of the Ladies' Garment Workers' Union. So I knew how that was formed and about the, the strikes and how they were beaten down, et cetera. So I have my good background feeling before I go into it. Um, what I used to do in the beginning, in the earlier books in the Molly series is I would go to New York and I would walk the streets at 
I knew would come into the book. And I would think, you know, can you, do you get the wind coming straight from the Hudson here? Do you, can you hear the tugs on the East River here? And just all the things that Molly might see in here, because the lucky thing is in Greenwich Village or the Lower East Side, there's a whole area that hasn't changed since 1900. You can walk up Mulberry Street and you still have the same tenements. You can be in Greenwich Village and I can show you Molly's house. So there's a lot that really hasn't changed. So I used to, at the very beginning, go up and literally walk around. Um, anywhere Molly walked, I would walk. And I once had a, sn a snippy person saying, you had Molly work from walk from X to Y. She couldn't possibly have done that. It's too long. Wrote back, I did it. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, uh, I, I really, I, I, I played being Molly in those days and, and that was very useful. I know it so well now, I don't have to do it as much unless I were doing some sort of aspect of New York that I'd never done before. But then as well as that, I do a lot of background reading, you know, whatever the subject of, um, as opposed to the environment, the subject of the book is, if the book was on, you know, art at the Metropolitan Museum, or you know, so I read up lots of things on that. We have we had one book in which she goes to San Francisco for the earthquake, and amazingly, the San Francisco Historical Society has collected all these first person accounts. So I read all those. So you had people who had been in the earthquake, who had had amazing things happen to them. You had people whose houses had shaken, and all of the china was sitting on the shelf, completely untouched or else you had houses shaken where everything had come down into pieces. So I knew what had happened to real people in, and when you, when you bring in some real person's experience, you validate it so that somebody reading that book will say, oh, that's, that's how it was. Not, oh, she's making up a good story about the earthquake, but yeah, that's how it was. So I love to do that. I love to give, uh, I love to validate with what real people have said about something. Absolutely. And that does ring so true, especially when you get readers who have shared those experiences or been in those places. Like yeah. anyone who's been through the earthquake knows that it through in an earthquake, not, yeah. hopefully not one of the scale of no. um, San Francisco at that time, but that it can be really strange what is affected and what isn't, that it's not necessarily logical or even. And yeah. so... Our daughter was at UC Santa Cruz when the Loma Prieta happened and mm -hmm. it depended which way your dorm room was facing. If it was facing with the shaking, really nothing fell down. If it was shaking against the shaking, everything fell down. So it was a bit of luck as to where you were. Higher stakes for dorm room draws. <laughs> <laughs> um, with that, do you ever find yourself having to buffer against having the books become almost like a report of all the historical knowledge you've gained? Or do you find that your story always um, pushes through, that that's what you're really focused in? That's the big challenge always, isn't it? You, I know how much I know. Do I want you to know everything that I know? Am I going to say to you, okay, I've done all this research and now you're damn well going to get it with you, like it or not. Um, so really I try and, I'm very, you have to be character driven. I have to feel that I'm following Molly Murphy or whoever I'm writing about and I'm seeing everything through her eyes. So if she's not, if it's not gonna be seen through her eyes and it's not gonna be part of her character arc, it doesn't have a place. And that's so sad sometimes because you have to leave out some really good stuff that I know because she wouldn't know it. You know, so I read a book once in, uh, I, I, when I do uh, writing workshops, I give this as an example. I read a book once taking place in Queen Elizabeth's time and there's a doctor who's the main character and he is called out on a case and he rushes up to get his doctor bag. And as he's coming down the stairs, he couldn't help thinking about the 30 years war. Now, I don't know about you, but I've never stopped halfway down the stairs and gone, oh my God, the 30 years war. <laughs> <laughs> So the, the point was she'd done this research and she wanted to make sure you knew about it. And it felt like that because the point is he's being called out to what's going to be a murder investigation. There's a huge pressure of time here and she stopped it. She's taken away our momentum, which is that's what you don't do. You want everything to if, what you do is every single scene in the book, you say to yourself, why is that scene here? Is it showing me more about character? Is it driving the plot forward? Is it enhancing our feeling of setting and sense of place? 
And if it isn't any of those things, then it doesn't, even if it's the most wonderful dialogue in the world, it has to go. So that's, you know, that's how I work when I'm going through it, edit, editing at the end. Do we really need this scene? Could, could that information just not have been slipped in when she was doing X, Y, and Z? And um, so, yeah, I'm quite brutal with myself when I go through and edit afterwards. Absolutely. That's, that's one of those brutal parts of editing. Um, but I feel like, you know, you're talking about when you were young and writing your first plays as a young woman that, you know, they were all intensely dramatic. I feel like that bodes well. I mean, I end up being an art historian before a librarian and my childhood writings were all reports Yeah, and it shows. <laughs> so I know the kind of historical novel I would write and it's nonfiction. Um, so I feel like that interest in the, in the characters and the drama and the stakes, um, probably helps pushing against that. And also I think the character has to be that fine line between a person of her time and a person you can relate to today. If she is too far like, oh, forsooth, but Sir Jasper, do not come near me. Um, you know, the, the people are going to feel they're reading some sort of historical treatise as opposed to sort of saying, oh, Molly, don't go in that room. You know, that's what you want them to do. You want everybody to feel that they're there with Molly. And if she makes a bad decision, you think, oh, don't do that. You know, uh, I, that's what I want my readers to feel, that I've transported them. I have teleported them back to 1903 or 1904. And they're now in that time. And everything that they're experiencing is in that time. Absolutely. Well, and I think, um, also talking about one of your other very well-known series, um, Lady Georgiana is kind of like that, you know, and she's this amazing, relatable, fun character who for most of our, you know, most of the people here in the Lincoln Public Library who are not anywhere in line to the throne, um, much less <laughs> I forget exactly how, how far back she is, but that so much of her world is not just different by time, but different by culture, different by circumstance than what a lot of readers, and yet she is a delight. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how she came about. Ah, well, yeah, Lady Georgiana, she's at the beginning of the series, she's 34th in line to the throne of England in the 1930s, but her branch of the family is quite penniless, and her only option seems to be to marry some awful European prince that she doesn't want to do, obviously. Um, so she escapes and tries to make her own way in the world, which doesn't go well in the first few books in the series. She came about because my publisher kept saying to me, we can't really break you out unless you write us a big, dark, standalone novel. So I kept thinking, oh, standalone novel, big, dark, child molesters, serial killers, terrorists poisoning the water supply. And then I'd turn on the television and I'd think, wait, do I want to spend six months in darkness? So I thought, okay, what is the most improbable sleuth I can possibly come up with? How about if she's royal? But she's penniless. And it's the 1930s, you know, that wonderful time poised between two world wars. Some things in the world have changed, some things haven't. In 1930, still the biggest employment category was domestic servant in England. So, you know, you've still got Downton Abbey's, you've still got people who are going to their yachts on the Med, and yet you've got the Great Depression, you've got men standing in line for soup and wearing all their medals from World War I, but holding up a sign saying, we'll accept any sort of work. So you've got this great dichotomy and all these good stories to write about. And then, of course, with the royals, you've got... Um, Prince of Wales, Mrs. Simpson, all these interesting royal stories too, which are wonderful to write about. You know, I love writing about Mrs. Simpson, don't you? She comes in all the books. Um, so I, I, I came up with, what I did was I just started writing almost um, stream of consciousness in Georgie's voice. And it came to me instantly. And I wrote, I just wrote uh, what then became the first chapter of her Royal Spiness. And interestingly, that first chapter is absolutely word for word as I wrote that first talking to you. They didn't change a thing. So it was sent to my publisher and my publisher looked at it and went, no, no, this wasn't what we wanted at all. No, no. So my agent said, well, you don't mind if we send it to other people then, do you? And they went, no, of course not. Anyway, so it was put out to bid. Somebody else got it. And then it started doing very well. So the first publisher started saying, oh, well, 
in that other series. And we'll go, yes. <laughs> so that was very nice. It was very affirming. I enjoyed every moment of it. And I think Lady Georgie has done so well because she is she's fun, first of all. I think everybody likes to laugh. And this book, as well as being, they are mysteries. There's going to be a few nicely well-behaved bodies in them. But um, uh, I think what people like is the characters are very quirky, fun things happen, embarrassing things happen to Georgie. Um, people can relate to her because her life doesn't go smoothly because she's a bit clumsy at times. She's a little bit awkward, naive. And also she's poised between two worlds. Her father was um, Queen Victoria's grandson, but he married an actress who was from a very humble family. So she has a grandfather who was a, an English policeman who lives in a little house. And so I think she's a good observer because she's poised between these two worlds and she can see like the ridiculous side of both of them as I can. I think the reason that works well for me is I live in America. When I go home to England, I can observe. You know, I married a man who, um, whose family had this sort of lifestyle, um, who, um, you know, very upper class, big stately homes, lots of butlers and things. And they say silly things and I love it. They, they really do have cousins with, we have a cousin called Fig. We have a cousin called Dude. We have a cousin called Puff. Um, so, you know, I can put all these in my books and I love it. And I go over there and they say, oh, do you remember that joke we played on the butler? And I sort of scribble it down quickly. So I've got lots of information, lots of good stuff for my books just come from being among family members. So I think that's one of the things that works well with this series is it, it's real. Absolutely. And that seems to be a um, running theme with your work. You know, you talked about with the Evans series, being born so much about of your experience and your knowledge of the Welsh countryside, Welsh community, Welsh culture, um, doing all the historical research for Molly and really knowing what's going through there. And then here with this, again, having these kind of really strong factual backbones that you can drop in and work through with the story. Yeah, I think I don't think you can write about something well unless you really you've got it in here. You know, my friend Cara Black, who writes those wonderful books about Paris, she goes to Paris every year and she she sleeps on someone's couch and she wanders around back alleys and she just sees fun things happening. And there are things in her books which you would never be able to invent if you hadn't seen them. There's one of the books where she's going through the garment district and they're load, it's raining, so she comes under an awning and they're loading bales of cloth down this chute into a basement. And she thinks, Amy could get away that way. So she goes to stand there to see, and they go, no, no, madame, go away from here. Well, you'd never find that out unless you were down a back alley on a rainy day in Paris. And I think the same for me, the fact that someone in my family will say something silly, or I will see something in a British newspaper, or I'm in London and something happens. They're just little things that trigger for you, oh, that would make a good scene in a book. And of course, with Georgie, I think one of the fun things with Georgie is a lot of the most embarrassing things that have happened to her have happened to me. Um, in, one, in the first book, Her Royal Spinus, Georgie uh, helps out her friend Belinda, who has become a clothing designer, and she puts on an outfit to model for a, a very exclusive guest, um, who happens to be Mrs. Simpson, as we later find out. But um, it's a very strange outfit, and it's sort of a, a one piece, and it had very tight trousers that come over her hips, and it buttons up at the back. And she can hardly walk when she comes out. And then she started to walk and she looks down and something's flapping beside her. And she thinks this is really a very strange outfit. And then she realizes it is culottes and I'm in half of it. And my editor said, this scene is too silly. We need to take this out. And I said, it happened to me. In my modeling career, that happened to me. I put on an outfit, it turned out to be culottes and I was in half of it. And I had to walk up and down a little walk with everybody looking at me before I could escape. Um, so, you know, so think if something terrible has happened to me, poor Georgie has to suffer with it too. Well, and I think though that that's one, I mean, I think with Georgie too, kind of how you were talking about modeling, that you had to walk all the way up and down before you could escape. She has all of these etiquette rules that she has to follow as well that kind of constrict her escape routes in different situations. She does, yeah. I mean, she, she's had lots of um, 
she gets called by the Queen to do things. This is Queen Mary, of course, in 1930. She gets called by the Queen to do things sometimes. And sometimes they're embarrassing things and sometimes they don't go well. You know, so poor Georgie, just when she thinks life is going smoothly, um, something terrible happens again. Well, obviously, that's what makes a good, a good mystery is that, you know, you make your sleuth suffer as well as, as, well as solve crimes. Absolutely. So now you mentioned that, you know, this is the Georgie series started as what was intended to be a standalone book. Mm -hmm. A lot of what you work in are series and really extensive series. Can you talk a little bit about what is so magical to you about working in series and how you move between these different voices? Um, Well, the nice thing about series is every time you go back, it's like going to a high school reunion. You know where you are, you know the rules of that place, you know who your friends are there, you know who your enemies are there. And so it's it's stepping back into an environment you feel very comfortable, you know, here I am, I'm back with Georgie and here's her maid Queenie and and her mother's come in and oh, so we meet everybody again who's an old favorite and I love that. Um, And um, the thing that's uh, a negative with series is you are, in that environment. You can't suddenly escape, say, oh, let's go to the South Seas for the next one. You know, your your characters are bound by their time and their place and their social status and what they do. So there are some things you could never do with that series. Um, So it'll be interesting because Georgie is getting closer and closer to World War II. So I have to decide this is a comic series, essentially how do I want to touch on World War II? Obviously there are so many things where you, it would just be improper to go there. So can I find something funny to do about World War II that would not embarrass anybody or offend anybody? It's one of those difficult, so we'll see when we get there, but it's one of those things I do think about. So, you know, that's that's the difficulty with a series is you are bound by, and of course mine are first person too. All of my stories, you can only know what Molly or Georgie know. You can't find out anything else unless somebody tells you. So they are limiting in a way, in a good way. It's the fact that they are first person and they just start talking and they don't stop till I finish the book. So I love that. (laughs) Oh, yes. This is the latest one. The Last Mrs. Summers came out in August. And if anybody has read Rebecca, you will notice the similarities because I wrote this book to be a complete homage to Rebecca. Um, it's got Georgie finds herself in this big, uh, creepy house. There's a very alarming housekeeper. There's a first wife who may have come to a bad end that we don't quite know about. Um, there's an element of danger going through the whole thing. So it was such fun to write because there's so many little details that are just like Rebecca. And I just thought it would be fun to have Georgie be away from her normal situation, but be in a place like this. So now what made you want to do an homage to Rebecca? I am assuming that that's a novel that means a lot to you. Well, I think I I, I discovered Rebecca in my teens and it was the first book where I realized that a writer can play with a reader's emotions. You know, most books, well, I'd read all the Agatha Christie and you read it and then Hercule Poirot says, I am going to reveal to you who the murderer is and then it's over. Um, In Rebecca, the writer very cleverly makes you believe this one thing, which is um, all about Rebecca, the first wife. You come to believe how wonderful this person was. And in the middle of the book, she stabs you in the back and you go, oh, so I got it all wrong. And I thought, this is so clever. I read it again before I wrote uh, the book, The Last Mrs. Summers. And I have to say that I now was really annoyed with the main character because she doesn't stick up for herself. You know, she's known throughout the book as, um, as the second Mrs. De Winter. That's all she's known as. We don't ever know her first name as if she doesn't matter. And I thought if that were me, and someone said, oh, the vase has always been there because Rebecca liked it there. I would say, well, I want it over here now, move it. Um, but then it wouldn't have been such a good book. So, <laughs> but, but it, she does manage to create this incredible atmosphere, this atmosphere of danger and distrust and who do you trust throughout the whole book. So, and also I spend my summers usually in Cornwall, um, which is, you know, this sort of, uh, windswept coastlines and, um, and, and ha- sort of big houses and everything. And so I, I have a good feel for this. And it's just the sort of place you can create atmosphere. In. So I've been, you know, I enjoy being there. 
That's fantastic. So, so obviously that's a book that's important to you. Do you have any other recommendations you want to share with our readers? What are some books that you've loved or that are important to you or that you've just enjoyed recently? Um, well, my, my go-to at the beginning of this pandemic, when everything was so alarming, I went back to old favorites. So I read the Lord of the Rings. I read all the Chronicles of Narnia. I read Harry Potter. So, you know, their books were, um, I like to read books where you know the ending is going to be okay. Um, but uh, what I read this summer, um, I read one book that I really liked called The Lost Girls of Devon by Barbara O'Neill. That was again one of these ones. I love books where you're in several different time periods. I love Kate Morton, you know, The Forgotten Garden and The Secret Keeper. I think they're terrific. Um, I've tried to write a couple of those, of course. And um, uh, I really enjoyed, Jen McKinley has written a book called um, Paris is always a good idea. And that's mm. a perfect escape novel for right now. It's about a career woman who goes, who realizes that her life has just slipped away and she goes to relive romances she had during her gap year in Ireland and in Paris. Mm. And, you know, every, and they're silly and embarrassing things happen to her, very like the sort of things I write, but mm. I loved it because it was just total and utter escape. Oh, that's fantastic, which we can all use a little bit of right now, oh, absolutely, right especially now. as we're home. Well, you know, I've had so many letters about people saying, thank you for Lady Georgie. She has helped me get through this pandemic. Um, you know, I'm stuck in the house by myself or, or I've had a, a relative who's had the virus or I've been really stressed. And these books just help me get through it. And yeah, it makes you feel really good that you, you're that, and you've done a little thing that was good for other people's lives. That's fantastic. Absolutely. Especially because, you know, you send these novels off into the world and you hope that they mean things to people, that they bring joy to people, but you don't always hear that back. You know, I know it can be lonely. You, you, you know, when I'm writing them, if they, they'd say, why do you write your book? Are you, are you writing the great American novel? I'd say, no, I'm writing to provide entertainment, to, um, you know, to give people a good, a rattling good read, I think I would say, <laughs> but to find that they've meant something. I've had letters over the years that said, you helped me get through chemotherapy, or you've helped me when my mum died, and you suddenly realize this books have more power than I realized, and that's a sobering thought, really. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, okay, well, we've got a few questions from our listeners, but before that, I have one last, perhaps controversial question. Oh. Yes, as, as a, a native of England um, and familiar with Wales, I do have to ask, in the perfect cup of tea, are you tea first or milk first? Um, I personally am tea first, although a lot of people are milk first. Uh, because I tell you why, because if you put the tea in first, you know how much milk to pour in till you get exactly the color that's right. Absolutely. I, I do not, I, I am milk first personally, but I do know that this can be deeply contentious in certain circles. But And I have to tell you too, that that's one of the, we've lived in this country for many, many years. It's one of the few things we still buy good tea, loose tea, and my husband blends our uh, blend, so mm. it has little little Darjeeling, a little uh, um, Chinese kimun, and um, uh, then some loose leaf tea to give it the oomph, and uh, it's very nice. And that's the one thing we do is we make real tea. That's fantastic. It's fantastic. All right. Okay. So our first question is of your series. Do you have a favorite? That's like saying which of your children is your favorite. You know? <laughs> Um, you, I have to be quite honest on this. Um, I always favor the one I'm not writing right now. Um, I always find I'm sitting down at the computer and I go, oh, four more chapters of Molly to go. Then I can go back to look Lady Georgie and then I'm really excited. And then, oh, I've got five more chapters of Lady Georgie to go. And I can't wait to get back to Molly. So it's always what you, what you, what you don't have like now seems very appealing. Absolutely. But no, no, I, I, think, you know, I love my heroines. I think having done all these books, if I didn't really love my heroine, I would have stopped by now because I have to be rooting for her all the time. I have to be in her shoes. And I find when I'm writing a book, I'm so involved with it that sometimes I'm not sure which is reality and which isn't. You know, I've been writing a book in which someone's stuck in the snow 
and I go and get a sweater and I suddenly think, wait, and it's 93 out there. But, um, you know, that's how I am. I'm, I'm, I'm involved like that. So, uh, you know, I have, I have to love my heroines. Well, and you mentioned with the um, Evan Evans series that that was one of the things that um, struck you to go out and start writing other series was you weren't rooting for him as much. That may be, yeah. I mean, I think I wanted to get and give him a little prod and say, you know, go and go and tell that sergeant that was very rude what you said, what he said to you right now. But um, no, he he was he was nice, but a little little lacking in spine. Too, you know, he, he stayed a constable for about eight or nine books. Well, he should have sort of gone and said, it's about time you promoted me. <laughs> Look at all these cases I'm solving. Yeah, right. Yeah. So with Evan Evans, um, one of our attendees uh, got to climb, as they put it, a bit of Mount Snowden last year and is wondering whether you ever might revisit Evan Evans. Um, I'd like to. Um, I keep promising that I will do an Evan Evans novella because I know so many people are interested to see what's happened to him and Bronwyn. Have they had any kids yet? Has he become a sergeant yet? Um, it's just a matter of time. You know, the, I write these big standalone novels yet that we haven't even addressed. Um, and um, the thing, the nice thing with a standalone is I can just come and revisit, I can visit a time period or a place and then I can leave it and go away again. The one I have coming out next year is set in Venice. So, you know, I go and do my research in Venice and I write this lovely book and then I can leave it. So I have to think about that. And how would I want to spend my time? I can't do more than two books a year. I don't want to do more than two books a year. So, oh yes, you, isn't that, is that the best cover you've ever seen in your entire life? I think that's so wonderful. If I saw that book at the airport, I'd rush and buy it. So um, uh, yeah, it comes out next April. And it's again, one of these books that's set in three different time periods. Um, and it's a, 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 someone's secret life that people are finding out about. So speaking of kind of your standalones, we did have one of our attendees mention that they really enjoy um, your no series books and particularly the ones set in World War II. Mm -hmm. And I know with Georgie, you mentioned that with World War II coming up in her storyline, um, handling that in the tone of that book, of that series is really interesting. Um, can you share a little bit about those books um, that are set well, around World War II? One we're looking at now above the Bay of Angels is further back. That takes place. That's about Queen Victoria and her time in the south of France. But um and the reason I wrote that was I was in Nice and we saw this fantastic building and I said to the gardener, is this a hotel? And he said, no, madame, it's, it's apartments now, but it used to be a hotel because it was built for your queen. And I said, for Queen Elizabeth? He said, no, no, madame, for Queen Victoria. And I had never known that she'd spent entire winters in the south of France before then. And then I found, I did some research and I found out she'd gone, she'd come on a private train and brought her whole court with her. She brought her bedroom furniture with her, all of her maids, all of her footmen and all of her cooks. And I thought, you're coming to France. You're coming to a, a tip top hotel in France and you're bringing your own cooks. What are you thinking of? So then I decided to write a book about a young woman who became her cook. And that's what, that was the driving force behind Above the Bay of Angels. But the two, one, two I've done about World War II, I've done In Farley Field and The Tuscan Child, both take place in World War II. And um, both very different world's war stories. The Tuscan Child is an English airman who, whose plane comes down in Tuscany and he's hidden at great risk to herself by a Tuscan woman. And years later, um, years later, her son and, um, and his daughter meet up in Tuscany and find out what really happened. Uh, mm. And in Farley Field it is much more thriller. It's about um, a, a plot. We don't, don't know what the plot is, but a plot that's going on and how a, a, a big house is um, uh, involved and the people in that area might be involved in something very dangerous. And we don't find out what it is till close to the end of the book. Fantastic. And so do you find that kind of the... How do you find that kind of the drama of wartime works into building these stories in comparison to kind of your more traditional mystery models? Well, I think, first of all, in a war, everybody is living with heightened emotion. I mean, think how we are right now in a time of a pandemic, a time of election. 
we're finding that the stress never really goes away. It's there all the time. That's what it's like in a war for everybody. You don't know where, when, whether you're going to be bombed. You don't know whether your loved one is safe. If you're out with the army, you don't know when you're going to be attacked next. So everybody is living on heightened emotion all the time. So you've got that to start with. And then you've got all the little vignettes of stories of the people who do little heroic deeds or the people who do evil things and are not caught. Um, there's just so many stories you could go on forever and ever with World War II. And I think the, the appealing thing about World War II as opposed to any other war, this was the last time we had a clear sense of good versus evil. You know, every war since then has been tinged with shades of gray. And this one, everyone thought I have to do my bit or evil will swallow the world. And so, you know, you have that driving force behind it. And I think it's very appealing to all of us to know where good was and where evil was. Absolutely, I can see that. So we've also got a couple of questions about your children's books and what name those were published under and what the title was of that first children's book. Oh, my very first children's book um, was written under my married name, which is Janet Quinn Harkin, hyphenated. And it was called Peter Penny's Dance. And you probably still find it in libraries, even though it's years later, it had a long, a long shelf life. Fantastic. Well, if we don't have that in our collection, we're going to have to because Kirk is stars. Uh, oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> it did it well, yes. And then we've got a question going back to um, her royal spyness, which is that for some of the historical figures, um, so this attendee has read that for some of the historical figures, you use some of their actual quotes for their dialogue. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the process of matching a quote to a scene and reworking that into your stories. Uh, that, that was very important to me. When I started, especially if I'm using royal characters, um, I wanted to make sure that anything they said had been something they had really said. So, um, you know, when Queen, Queen Mary says things about what she thinks about her son and the woman in his life and things. So I've actually used those quotes. And as I've got more comfortable with the series, obviously we're up now, I'm writing book 15. Um, I, I have the royal people sometimes say things, not that in words that they've actually said, but I know what opinions they've expressed. Um, so I can do that. But so, when I can bring in a real quote and it fits with the story, I love doing that. There's one of the books in which Georgie meets Princess Elizabeth and Princess Margaret. Um, and they are at that time about seven and about four, seven, three. And um, Georgie in fact is their cousin. Um, and, but, uh, so Elizabeth says to hello Georgie, and um, she says, hello Margaret. And Margaret, who's just become rather sassy with, um, says you have to call me Princess Margaret, because I'm a princess. So Georgie says, well, in that case, you have to call me Lady Georgie, because I'm a lady. So Margaret looks up at her and says, is a lady better than a princess? And their governess says, we hope a princess will grow up to be a lady. And those were all real, real quotes that I had to put in. I thought it was just so fantastic. Oh, that's wonderful. And that rings so true with that age. Yeah. 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 You know, and Margaret always was the sassy. I mean, Margaret was the one who told her sister that if she didn't want to be queen, she would take it over for her. <laughs> Seriously, she did that. She said, well, if you don't want to be queen, I will. Gotta love siblings. Gotta <laughs> love siblings. Yeah. Um, and so we've got a, I think this is a recommendation. One of our attendees is wondering whether you've read Jody Taylor's The Chronicles of St. Mary's. No, I haven't. And I actually, I, thank you very much. I will write that down. I, I always look for good books to read, you know? Absolutely. And then um, we also have a question of whether there's any chance that Lady Georgie will end up on TV, whether as a BBC series or Amazon or okay. something we can all binge watch. I would love that. Um, we've had various nibbles. We, um, at one stage, at the very beginning, when Her Royal Spiness came out, it was bought, that, that one book was bought to make, in quotes, a major motion picture. And um, 
it never came out. They went through three or four screenwriters, someone from the company moved on and then it just all fell apart. They did pay me for it, so that was quite nice, but um, I would love it to be a TV series. I think it just has a lot of visual aspect to it and I think it could be a lot of fun. So I'm hoping the BBC will have finally pick it up, you know, who knows? I'm, I'm always quite bemused as to the ones that they decide to make and the ones they don't decide to make because, you know, I can see so many fabulous books that don't get made and then sort of mediocre books. And you think, oh, why did they make that into a... Anyway. anyway. It does seem to be a strange and complicated process, um, having adaptations made and actually making it through production to release. Yeah. And, uh, well, uh, the, the very, at this moment, my Constable Evans series is optioned by CBS and has been optioned by them for about, at least four years. They keep renewing the option. Um, but it, nothing's happened to it yet. But then I worry, you know, CBS, if they, if they ever make it, will they make it sort of in Malibu with sort of cardboard houses and pretend it's whales? You never know. So, I mean, that's the thing is a, a TV series can be wonderful. It can really enhance something or it can come out just slightly wrong and completely ruin something. So, you know, there's good news, bad news about it. Absolutely. You know, it is putting something that you've put so much of your heart and time into, into someone else's hands. And sometimes that can just be amazing to see another creative mind engage and play in the world you've built. And sometimes it can be terrifying. Yeah. I mean, if they just get the main character wrong for one, one reason or another, you know, and and people go, oh, I don't like this person. You've ruined your series, which is really sad. Mm -hmm. So who would you want to see play Lady Georgie? Well, um, when I was asked this a few years ago, I said I thought Emma Watson could do a good job. Um, I also think Lily James would be rather nice. She'd, be, she'd get it right, I think. Yeah. It just depends how long it goes on because then they'll all be too old for George. You know, she is 21 when it starts, so we need someone who's, who's younger. Absolutely. But then I'd have, to, I'd have to audition the person for Darcy. I'd have to audition them personally, you know. And, uh, <laughs> well... Of course, like, you know, you, you're the creator. You need to make sure. Yes. Fantastic. Well, if we've got anyone who is on the phone looking to ask a question, if you want to raise your hand, I believe it's star nine allows you to do that if you're on an actual cell phone or something like that. Otherwise, we are coming to the top of the hour. We do have one chat. Have we looked at that one? Um, Yes, and that is the one that was talking about um, matching quotes for the historical figures. Okay, good. And we do have someone sharing that they uh, enjoy the Molly Murphy series and the, the, um, let's see, I've read Irish history. I understood why Molly could not find justice against her landlord's son. Well, and also, uh, if you like the Molly series, stay tuned. There might maybe some good news soon. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> Wonderful little teaser there. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining us. This has been wonderful. Um, if you are not familiar with any of the series or books that we've talked about, you can pick them up from your local library. Or you can also um, purchase them, which supports our fantastic author, either through major retailers like Amazon or Barnes & Noble, or through your local independent bookstore, who I know would be happy to get your order during this time. Yeah, and there are plenty of, let me add, there are plenty of bookstores now who will ship to you. You know, there's Book Passage in Corte Madeira, there's Poison Pen in Phoenix, there's Murder by the Book in Houston, and they will all ship books very easily to you. So, uh, and they have all my books, so any of them you want. There you go. Um, And then we are continuing this series over the next several months. So keep your eyes on our website, libraryatlincoln.org. You can also sign up for the Friends of the Library newsletter and get that in your inbox every month. And that will tell you all of the fun activities we're doing. And otherwise, have a wonderful day. And thank you again, Reese. This has been a lot of fun. Thank you. And thank you, you everybody, for for joining today. I wish I could see all your faces, but apparently we we can't get that. Just, uh, but anyway... I'm sending you all love. Please stay safe, everyone.